Verse 7 says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not, knoweth not whether he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. My Father, Lord, I come to you now, and I, I thank you for giving me the scripture, and Lord, you give it to all of us. I ask, Lord, that you just open our hearts and minds. Lord, help me to be able to give the words you've given me, and Lord, help me be able to hear them. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for us, and how you've protected us, and how you've been with us. Lord, bless us tonight. Of course, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have you ever said, that's my cup of tea, or ever heard it said, or I'll be there with bells on, or you look happy as a clam, or I love bringing home the bacon, and that could mean money or the bacon, whatever. (laughs) Words like money, they can be in circulation for such a long time that they start wearing out. Unfortunately, the word love is losing its value. And it's being used to cover a multitude of sins. It's really difficult to understand how a man can use the same word to express his love for his wife as he uses to tell how he feels about bringing home the bacon. When words are used carelessly, they really mean little or nothing at all. Like the dollar, they've been devalued. As John is describing matters from his heart, he, used, he uses three words repeatedly. And you'll see this as you read through anything that John writes. It's life, love, and light. In fact, he devoted three sections of this book of John to the subject of Christian love. He explains that love, life, and light, they belong together. If you read these three sections, love in 1 John 2, 7 through 11, life in chapter 3, verses 10 through 24, and light in chapter 4, verses 7 through 21, if you read it without any of the other verses, you'll see that love, life, and light must not be separated. Currently, we'll see in in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 7 through 11, how Christian love is affected by light and darkness. A Christian who is walking in the light, which simply means they're obeying God, is going to love his brother Christian. In 1 John 3, chapter chapter 3, verses 10 through 24, we're told that Christian love is a matter of life or death. To live in hatred is to live in spiritual death. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21, we see that Christian love is a matter of truth or error. Because we know God's love toward us, we show God's love toward others. In these three sections, we find three good reasons why Christians should love one another. The first reason, God's commanded us to love. We see that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Reason two, we've been born of God, and God's love lives in us. We see that in 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 24. The third reason, God first revealed his love to us. See that in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. We love, why? Because he first loved us. John not only wrote about love, but he also practiced it. One of his favorite names for his readers was Beloved. He felt love for them. And that's for us because we're some of his readers, right? John's known as the apostle of love because in his gospel and his epistles, he gives us importance to the subject. However, John was not always the apostle of love. (laughs) At one time, Jesus gave John and his brother James, both of whom had 
from what we can understand, serious tempers, the nickname Boanagers. We see this in Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. And James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanagers, that's a hard word to say, which is the sons of thunder. Imagine being nicknamed the sons of thunder, because <laughs> all you do is argue. Well, that's, that's what they were nicknamed by Jesus. On another occasion, these two brothers wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy a village. We see that in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. Since the New Testament was written in Greek, the writers were often able to use more precise language. It's unfortunate that our English word love has so many shades of meaning, some of them contradictory. And if you look at the dictionary at the word love, there's, uh, there's more meanings than I cared to count when I looked it up. So I didn't put a number on it. But look it up one day. See how many, many words there are for the word love that we have in the English language. When we read in First John about love, the Greek word used is agape. The word for God's love toward man. A Christian's love for other Christians. And it's God's love for his church. We see this in Ephesians 5, chapter 22, verse, verses 33. Another Greek word for love is philia. It's used elsewhere. It carries the idea of friendship love, which is not quite as profound or divine as agape love. The Greek word for sensual love, euros, from which we get our word erotic. It's not used at all in the New Testament. The amazing thing is that Christian love is both old and new. We see this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 8 that we read. This seems to be a contradiction. Bear with me. Love itself, of course, it's not new, nor is the commandment that men love God and each other a new thing. Jesus combined two Old Testament commandments, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And Leviticus 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And he said in Mark 12, chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. And if you want to flip over there, it's Mark 12. Mark 12. And we're going to reverse 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well answered him which is the first commandment of all which is the first commandment of all and jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is here o israel the lord our god is one lord and thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. These two commandments summarize all the law and the prophets. Loving God and loving one's neighbor were old, familiar responsibilities before Jesus ever came to earth. In what sense then, is love one another a new commandment? It's John 2 and verse 8. So what's it a new commandment? Again, to look at the word Greek word helps to answer the question. The Greeks had two different words for new. One means new in time. And the other means new in quality. For example, you use the first word to describe eh, the latest car, a recent model. But if you purchased a car which was so wonderful, revolutionary, 
that it was entirely different, you would use the second word, new in quality. The English word recent and fresh just about make the distinction between recent means new in time, fresh would mean new in character. The command to love one another, it's not new in time, but it's new in character. Because of Jesus Christ, the old commandment to love one another was taken on new meaning. We learn in these five brief verses, in 1 John chapter 2, 7 through 11, five verses, that the commandment is new in three important ways. And that's what I'm going to tell you about tonight. The three important ways. First way, it's new in emphasis. We see this in chapter 2 and verse 7. It's new in emphasis. In 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6, John had been talking about the commandments in general. But now he narrows his focus down to one single commandment in the Old Testament. The commandment that God's people love one another was only one of many. But now this old commandment is lifted out and given a place of greatness. How is it possible for one commandment to stand head and shoulders above all the others? This is explained by the fact that love is the fulfillment of God's law. We see this in Romans 13, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. I'm going to read it to you. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. The commandment, love one another, is the fulfillment of God's law. When you love people, you do not lie about them. You don't steal from them. You, you have no desire to kill them. Love for God and love for others motivates a person to obey God's commandments without even thinking about them. When a person acts out of Christian love, he obeys God and serves others. Not because of fear, but because of his love. This is when John said that love one another is a new commandment. It's new in emphasis. It's not simply one of many commandments. No, it stands at the top of the list. But it is new in emphasis in another way too. It stands at the very beginning of the Christian life. The old commandment is the word which ye had from the beginning. See, it's in First John 2 and verse 7. This phrase, from the beginning, is used in two different ways in John's letter, and it's important that we understand them. In First John 1, 1, describing the eternality of Christ, we read that he existed from the beginning. We see this in, 1 John, in John 1, 1, the parallel phrase. We read, in the beginning was the word. But in 1 John 2 and 7, the subject is the beginning of the Christian life. The commandment to love one another is not an extension of our Christian experience as though God had an afterthought. No. It's, it's in our hearts from the very beginning of our faith in Jesus Christ. If this were not so, John could have written 1 John 3.14... He could not have written 1 John 3, 14, which says, We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And Jesus said, verse 35, John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. By nature, an unsaved person may be selfish. They can even be hateful. As much as we love a newborn baby, we must admit that the infant is self-centered and thinks the whole world revolves around the crib. The child, the child is typical of an unsaved person. Titus 3 and 3 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. 
This unretouched photo of the believer may not be beautiful, but it's certainly accurate. Some do not display the traits that are mentioned here, but the works of the flesh. Let's just read it. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Galatians, if you want to flip over there, chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The works of flesh are always potentially present in their dispositions. When a sinner trusts Christ, he receives a new life and a new nature. The Holy Spirit of God comes to live in him, and the love of God is, Romans 5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God did not have to give a new believer a long lecture about love. For ye yourselves are taught of God by the Holy Spirit within you to love one another. First Thessalonians 4 and verse 9. A new believer discovers that he now hates what he used to love and that he loves what he used to hate. So the commandment to love one another is new in emphasis. It's one of the most important commandments Christ gave us. John 13, verse 34. In fact, love one another is repeated at least 12, 12 times in the New Testament. John chapter 13, verse 34. 15, John chapter 15, verse 9, 12, and 17. Romans 13, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 4, and verse 9. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. 1 John 3, and verse 11 and 23. 1 John 4, verses 7, 11, and 12. And 2 John, verse 5. And there are many, many other references to brotherly love. It's important that we understand the meaning of Christian love. It's not a shallow, sentimental emotion that Christians try to work up or so that they can get along with each other. It's a matter of the will rather than an emotion. It's an affection for and an attraction to certain persons. It's the matter of determining or making up your mind that you will allow God's love to reach others through you. And then it's of you acting toward them in loving ways. You're not to act as if you love them, but because you love them. This is not hypocrisy. It's obedience to God. Perhaps the best explanation of Christian love is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It has less than 13 verses. It's a short read. You know what? I tell you what. Let's just flip over. Let's just flip over and read it. Second, First Corinthians, verse, chapter thirteen. First Corinthians, chapter thirteen. Though I speak with the tongue of men and the angels, and have not charity, the word charity there is love. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to, to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh nor her own, is not easily provoked, thinking no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, that's fake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as also I am known. And now about a faith, hope, charity, which is love, these three, but the greatest gift of these is love. The commandment, love one another, is not only new in emphasis, but the second way. It's new in another way. And the second way is it's new in example. And that's uh, 1 John chapter where we are, 2 and verse 8. Love one another. John pointed out um, this was first true in Christ, and now it's true in the lives of those who are trusting Christ. Jesus himself the greatest example of this commandment. We think about that great statement, God is love, First John 4 and verse 8. It's anticipated here. When one looks at Jesus Christ, he sees love embodied by example and exemplified. In commanding us to love, Jesus does not ask us to do something that he's not already done himself. The four Gospels record records <laughs> record records are the account of a life lived in the spirit of love. And that life was lived under conditions far from being ideal. If you don't think thinks go back and look at some of the, the death investigation videos on what we did and what Jesus suffered. Jesus illustrated love by the very life that he lived. He never showed hatred or malice. His righteous soul hated all sin and disobedience, but he never hated the people who committed such sins. Even in his righteous announcements of judgment, there's always love. It's encouraging to think of Jesus' love for the 12 disciples. How then must it have broken his, his heart again and again as they argued over who was greatest or tried to keep people from seeing their master? Each of them was different from others. And Christ's love was broad enough to include each person in a personal, understanding way. He was patient with Peter's impulsiveness, Thomas's unbelief, and even Judah's treachery. When Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another, he was only telling them to do as he had done. Think about this. Our Lord's love for all kinds of people. The publicans and sinners were attracted by his love. We see this in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Even the lowest of the low could weep at his feet. Luke 7, verses 36 through 39. Spiritually hungry Rabbi Nicodemus could meet with him privately at night, John 3, verses 1 through 21. And 4,000 of the common people could listen to his teaching for three days, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, and then receive a miraculous meal from him. <laughs> he held babies in his arms. He spoke about children at play. He even comforted the woman who wept as the soldiers led him out to Calvary. Perhaps the greatest thing about Jesus' love was the way it touched even the lives of his enemies. He looked with loving pity on the religious leaders who in their spiritual blindness accused him of being in alliance with Satan. We see that in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24. When the mob came to arrest him, he could have called 10,000 angels from heaven for protection, but he yielded to his enemies. And then he died for them. He died for his enemies. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. We see that in John chapter 15, verse 13. But Jesus died not only for his friends, but also for his foes. And as they crucified him, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do in his life, in his teachings, and in his death. Jesus is the perfect example of this new commandment, love one another. And this is what helps to make the commandment new. In Christ, we have a new illustration of the old truth that God is love 
and that the life of love is a life of joy and victory. What is true in Christ should be true in each believer. As he is, so are we in this world. Verse John 4 and verse 17. A believer should live a Christian, a life of Christian love. See that in verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. First John 2 and verse 8. This reminds us of the emphasis on walking in the light. First John 1. Uh, two ways of life are contrasted. Those who walk in the light practice love. Those who walk in the darkness practice hatred. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes this truth. The darkness is passing away, but the light does not yet shine fully all over the world, nor does it penetrate every area of even a believer's life. When Christ was born, the day spring from on high visited the world. That's the sunshine, the, the, the morning sun. Luke 1, verse 78. The day spring means sunrise. The birth of Christ was the beginning of a new day for mankind. As he lived before men, taught them, he ministered to them, he spread the light of life and love. The people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up, Matthew 4 and verse 16. But there's a conflict in this world between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. John 1 verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. A literal translation could be, And the light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness is not able to put it out. Satan is the prince of darkness. And he extends his evil kingdom by means of lies and hatred. Christ is the son of righteousness. It's Malachi in verse four, chapter 4 and verse 2. And he extends his kingdom by means of truth and love. The kingdom of Christ and of Satan are in conflict today. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Proverbs 4 and verse 18. The darkness is passing away little by little, and the true light is shining brighter and brighter in our hearts. Jesus Christ is a standard of love for Christians. A commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, he said, as I loved you, that ye also love one another. John chapter 13, verse 34. He repeated this, is my commandment that you love one another as I loved you. John 15, verse 12. We are not to measure our Christian love against the love of some other Christians, but against the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. The old commandment becomes new to us, and we see it fulfilled in Christ. So the commandment, love one another, is new in emphasis and new in example. It's also new in the third and last way. It's new in experience. You see this in First John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. The passage continues the illustration of light and darkness. If a Christian walks in the light and in fellowship with God, he will also be in fellowship with others in God's family. Love and light, remember what we said, they go together. As much as hatred and darkness go together. It's easy to talk about Christian love, but much more difficult to practice it. For one thing, such love is not mere talk. First John 2 and verse 9. He that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. A Christian can say or sing that he loves his brother while he actually hates another believer. But this is him lying. In other words, it's, it's impossible to be in fellowship with the Father and out of fellowship with another Christian at the same time. Let that sink in. It's impossible to be in fellowship with the Father and out of fellowship with another Christian at the same time. This is one reason why God established the local church, the fellowship of believers. You can't be a Christian alone. You think about it, you can't do it. As we cannot live a complete and developing Christian life unless we are in fellowship with God's people. Christian life has two relationships, the vertical, which is Godward, 
and the horizontal, which is manward. And what God has joined together, man must not put asunder. Each of these two relationships is to be one of love, one for the other. Jesus dealt with this matter in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 21 through 26. A gift on the altar was not of any value as long as the worshiper had a dispute to settle with his brother. Jesus did not say that the worshiper had something against his brother, but that the brother had something against the worshiper. But even when we have been offended, we should not wait for the other one who's offended us to come to us. We should go to them. If we do not, Jesus warned us that we will end up in prison of spiritual judgment where we'll have to pay the last penny. We see this in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. In other words, when we conceal an unforgiving, unloving spirit, we harm ourselves the most. The contrast between saying and doing is one we've met before. We met it back a couple of times ago. It was one of the first ones of the, the heart, part one. It's First um, John chapter 1, verses 6, 8, and 10. It's easy to practice a Christianity of words or singing the right songs, using the right vocabulary, praying the right prayers, and doing so deceiving ourselves, and to thinking that we're spiritual. Our yes should mean yes, and our no should mean no. If we say we're in the light, we prove it by loving the brethren. Many Christians urgently need to be accepted, loved, and encouraged. Contrary to popular opinion, Christian love is not blind. When we practice true Christian love, we find life getting brighter and brighter. Hatred is what darkens life. When true Christians' love flows out of the heart, we'll have greater understanding and perception of spiritual things. That's why Paul prayed that our love may grow in knowledge and perception. See this in Philippians 1, verses 9 10. I'm going to read it to you. And this I pray, that our love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. A Christian who believes his brother is a Christian who sees more clearly. No book in the Bible illustrates the blinding power of, of hatred like the little book of Esther. <laughs> the events recorded there take place in Persia, where many of the Jews were living after the captivity. Haman, one of the king's chief men, had a burning hatred for the Jews. The only way they could satisfy this hatred was to see the whole nation destroyed. He plunged ahead in the evil plot, completely blind to the fact that the Jews would win and that he himself would be destroyed. Hatred is blinding people today. Christian love is not a shallow belief. It's not a passing emotion that we perhaps experience in a church service. Christian love is a practical thing. It applies to everyday life. Consider the one another statements in the New Testament, and you'll see how practical it is to love one another. There are over 20 one another statements. One another statements. Here's just a few. Wash one another's feet. We see this in John chapter 13 and verse 14. Probably talking about pedicures there. I'm almost sure of it. Prefer one another, Romans 12 and verse 10. Be of the same mind, one to another, Romans 12 and verse 16. Do not judge one another, Romans 14, 13. Receive one another, Romans 5, 15, verse 7. Admonish one another, Romans 15, 14. Edify or build up one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6 and verse 2. Confess your faults one to another, James 5 and verse 16. Use hospitality one to another, 1 Peter 4 and verse 9. In short, to love other Christians means to treat them the way God treats them and the way God treats us. What happens to a believer who does not love the brethren? Well, we've already seen the first tragic result. He lives in darkness. Though he probably thinks he's living in the light in 1 John 2 and verse 9. He thinks he sees, but he's actually blinded by the darkness of hatred. This is the kind of person who causes trouble in Christian groups. He thinks he's a spiritual giant with great understanding. 
then actually he's a babe in a very spiritual perception. He may read the Bible faithfully and pray fervently, but if he has hatred in his heart, he's living a lie. The second tragic result is that such a believer becomes a cause of stumbling, 1 John 2 and verse 10. It's bad enough that an unloving believer hurts himself, but when he starts to hurt others, the situation is far more serious. It's serious to walk in the darkness. It's dangerous to walk in the darkness when stumbling blocks are in the way. An unloving brother stumbles himself, and in addition, he causes others to stumble. There was a man walking down the, down the street, the dark street, one night when he saw a pinpoint of light coming toward him. It was wavering away here, there, and under. He thought perhaps the person carrying the light was ill or drunk. But as he got closer, he could see a man with a flashlight carrying a white cane. Why would a blind man be carrying a light? The man wondered. And then he decided to ask. The blind man smiled. I carry my light not so I can see, but so that others can see me. I cannot help being blind, he said, but I can help being a stumbling block to others. The best way to help other Christians not to stumble is to love them. Love makes us stepping stones. Hatred or any of its cousins, such as envy or malice, it makes us a stumbling block. It's important that we as Christians exercise love in our local church or else there will always be problems and disunity. Believers become believers come from different backgrounds. We do not always agree. A third tragic result of hatred is that it slows a believer's spiritual progress. First John 2 and verse 11, a blind man, a person who is walking in darkness, can never find his way. The only atmosphere that is beneficial to spiritual growth is the atmosphere of spiritual light of love. Just as the fruits of flowers need sunshine, so God's people need love, and they are growing or going to grow if they're going to grow. The commandment, love one another, becomes new to us in our own day-by-day experience. It's not enough for us to recognize that it's new and emphasis to say, yes, love is important, and it's not enough for us to see God's love exemplified by Jesus Christ. We must know that this love in our own experience. We must know this love in our own experience. The old commandment, love one another, becomes a new commandment as we practice God's love in daily life. So far, we, we've seen the negative side of First John 2, verses 9 through 11. Let's take a real quick look at the positive. If we practice Christian love, what will the wonderful results be? We'll be living in the light, living in fellowship with God and with our Christian brothers. Next, we'll, we'll not stumble or become stumbling blocks to others. And then lastly, we'll grow spiritually and we'll progress toward Christ-likeness. We should think about the contrast between the ugly works of flesh, Galatians 15, 5, verse 19 through 21, and the beautiful fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. When we were walking in the light, the seed of the word, Luke verse 8, 11, can take root and bear fruit. And the first thing the Spirit produces is love. But love does not live alone. Love produces joy. Hatred makes a man miserable. But love always brings him to joy. A Christian who walks in love is always experiencing some new joy because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. <laughs> when we blend love and joy, we'll have peace, and peace helps to produce patience. Walking in the light, walking in love, is the secret of Christian growth, which almost always begins with love. We must admit that we cannot generate Christian love under our own power. By nature, we're selfish and we're hateful. It's only as God's Spirit floods our heart with that love that we can love one another. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 5.5 5. The Spirit of God makes the commandment, love one another, into a new and exciting day-by-day -day experience. 
If we walk in the light, God's spirit produces love. If we walk in darkness, our own selfish spirit produces hatred. Our Christian life, it's a beautiful combination of something old and something new. The Holy Spirit takes the old things and makes them new things in our experience. Think them on the commandment of love this week. Love one another.